God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1, 13 to 14. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Today is the last Sunday of the liturgical year in the life of the church. That's right. Next week is liturgical New Year's Day. (laughs) Next Sunday kicks off the season of Advent. And so at this last Sunday, after the long season of Pentecost, we conclude with the celebration of Christ the King. In about another month's time, we will all be singing, Glory to the Newborn King. But today, the church is inviting us to remember that the King is already here, and he is the true King. In this last Sunday of the liturgical year, in year C of our three-year lectionary, we are taken back in St. Luke's Gospel to the Passion of Christ, specifically the Crucifixion, Good Friday. In our readings today, the church directs our gaze to a pitiful man, wounded, dying, rejected, the victim of all the world's violence and evil poured poured out upon one man. And the church is saying to us, behold, this is your king, a king enthroned upon a cross. You know, on, sixth, on the 6th of May of this coming year, they will crown a new king in Great Britain, Charles III. And one of the most magnificent anthems that they will sing on that occasion will no doubt be George Friedrich Handel's Zadok the Priest. The refrain of which is this, long live the king, God save the king, may the king live forever. You see, since ancient times, it was quite common to pray that the monarch would live forever because a long reign of a benevolent monarch is a good thing. It means stability, security, and hopefully peace. But the best monarchs that the world has ever known are kings and queens or rulers of all sorts who, while they exercise their earthly power over their own country, They know from whom their power ultimately comes, and that there is yet another king, a true king, a perfect king that is above them, Christ the King. With Christ Jesus as our king, we do not need to pray that he may live forever, reign forever, because he is the everlasting king. That is who he is by his nature. He will last forever. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. To my left is a potent image of Christ the king, a king enthroned, as it were, on a cross. But what is the duty of a king but to ensure the peace and prosperity of his people and to just Uh, judge justly for his subjects, to bring order and harmony to his people. Reigning from the cross, Christ the King does exactly that. For those who swear their allegiance to his majesty, he brings them peace. And this particular image of Christus Rex, Christ the King, is a unique one. On the one half, it shows Christ dressed as a king in fine clothing with all the splendor and magnificence of royalty. And for those who have eyes to see, this half gives us a glimpse of who Christ really is, the King Eternal, living and reigning from the right hand of God the Father in heaven where he now directs and governs his kingdom, the church. And then there's the second half. The second half of the image shows us what Christ would have looked like to those who crucified him and to those few that stood by on the, at the foot of the cross. In a last stand with violence and evil, his adversaries tried to humiliate him, to mock him, 
and they placed a sign above his head which read, Jesus, King of the Jews. But unwittingly, no truer words have ever been written. Christ is the ultimate benevolent universal king who laid down his life for his people, destroying the power of everlasting death. And he traded death for everlasting life. But we might say to ourselves, as many first century people did, how can the king of the Jews, a Messiah, be put on a cross, be mocked and humiliated by his executioners? After all, wouldn't a king, especially a divine king, the savior of the world, wouldn't he show a great display of power, wreaking vengeance on his enemies who oppressed his people for so many generations? Aren't kings meant to unify their countries, mobilize and lead great armies on the field of battle, defeating their foes in grand triumphant victories? Well, at Calvary, also known as Golgotha, the place of the skull. Jesus teaches us what he meant when he said, mine is not a kingdom of this world. Christ's kingship was to fight an even greater enemy, sin and death itself. But the question I want us all to reflect on today on this Christ the King Sunday is this. Can we stop violence with more violence? Can we overcome evil with more evil? Or to be overly simplistic, do two wrongs make a right? Jesus is a warrior king, but he does not use conventional weapons. Instead, the way he fought sin and death was to go beyond, behind enemy lines. He went to the furthest depths of God forsakenness, and he let the darkness of the world, all the vile cruelty that the world could, could muster, and he let it envelop him. In order to defeat evil itself, Jesus took upon himself the sins of the whole world. As St. Paul would later put it, Jesus became sin, and he hung it upon the cross to render it utterly, utterly powerless. So how can we ever question, how can we ever question that God might somehow be unwilling to forgive us our sins after all that he done, had done for us? I've heard many times from people that I've met that they feel this way, that they are afraid to come to church, afraid to come into a relationship with the Lord because they are keenly aware of their own shortcomings and sins. And they worry that God is more likely to condemn them than to forgive them. Or perhaps they, they think that coming to church should be reserved only for the righteous people. Well, they don't want to be hypocritical by donning the doors of the church. But my friends, if that were true, how many of us would be here this morning? We have to remember that coming to church isn't an, an award ceremony for the righteous who pat themselves on the back. Rather, the church exists as a hospital for sinners. As they nailed his hands and feet to the hard wood of the cross, what did Jesus say? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they are doing. Jesus didn't excuse their sin, but he mitigates it. Um, he mitigates the severity of their malice by giving the benefit of the doubt. They do not know what they are doing. That's the type of king Christ is. A king who does not want to see the punishment of his enemies, but rather that they repent from their wickedness and accept his invitation to life. Of the crucifixion, St. Cyril of Alexandria, writing in the fifth century, once wrote, Consider how the Savior and Lord of all, by whom the Father brought all things into existence, now refashions our human nature, restoring it to its intended state. The first man, Adam, began in a paradise, a paradise of delight. 
But when he spurned that lone commandment which he had been given, he fell under a curse and into condemnation for eating the fruit of a forbidden tree. But now Christ becomes the fruit of a different tree, the cross, that he might crown our nature with his own glory. Christ's obedience to the Father's will unraveled the effects of Adam's disobedience to the Father. And now as king, Christ empowers each and every one of us with the strength to say yes to God, even at our most uh, weakest points in our life. Through Christ, we have not only the ability, but we have the outstretched hand of God inviting us up to have a friendship with him. So this Christ the King Sunday, the church is reminding us that Jesus should be the heart, should be the king of all our hearts. And as soon as any one of us come to him, offering ourselves, offering our souls and bodies for service in his kingdom, he will gladly take each of us by the hand and lead us to paradise. Please allow me to close with a prayer. Lord, you are Christ the King, and we are your servants. Help us to see your cross as the source of your power and might. Help us to follow your will in this life, that we might one day be raised up as you were raised on the third day. Lord, we ask you always to reign in our hearts. In this we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.